It's often useful to think of history as a series of trends and long-term causes going back decades and centuries and sometimes longer that impact us here in the present moment. But while these long-term factors and causes are shaping the present, sometimes it feels like history can change on a dime. When the Khmer Rouge took over Cambodia officially in April of 1975, as the tanks and troops were rolling into the capital city of Phnom Penh, many people were out in the streets celebrating, thinking that this was the end of a years-long civil war in Cambodia and perhaps the beginning of a period of peace and prosperity. But for the people of Phnom Penh and the people of Cambodia, in something that must have felt like history turning on a dime, that dream of peace and prosperity was shattered by the next day. In order to achieve a communist utopia, the Khmer Rouge regime led by a man going by the name of Pol Pot, that regime expelled pretty much everybody from the cities of Cambodia, including the capital city of Phnom Penh, and forced them into communes and agricultural work in the countryside of Cambodia. This forced expulsion of people from the cities of Cambodia marked the beginning of a reign of chaos and terror that would result in the deaths of between 1.5 and 2 million people. Yukimni Chan was a child growing up in Phnom Penh, and he was there from the beginning of this expulsion of people from the capital city. He describes it saying, quote, The next day, Soldiers came and searched us. They took our jewelry, our car, and most of our clothes. Now everyone in our family had to walk, and we had to divide the remaining food among us to carry it on our backs. It was the dry season, and it was very hot. There was no water. People began to get heat stroke and fall down on the road. The soldiers wouldn't let us stop to help those who were sick. I couldn't believe what was happening. We walked for days, then weeks. Pregnant women gave birth under trees by the road. Old people died from exhaustion and lack of water. Everywhere was the sound of babies screaming and people crying for loved ones who had died and had to be left on the road. There was no time for funerals. Soldiers threw the bodies into empty ponds and kept everyone moving. Guns were pointed at us and tanks forced us to keep moving. I saw two men with their hands tied behind their backs. Soldiers were questioning them on the side of the road. The soldiers cut off the men's heads, which fell to the ground as their bodies slumped. There was nothing I could do. People were being murdered before my eyes. These were my friends, my neighbors. The rest of us kept walking. End quote. The forced removal of people from the cities of Cambodia was just the beginning of the horror and the terror that many people had to endure in Cambodia from 1975 to around 1979. It's hard to find an account of someone remembering their time in Cambodia who didn't lose a friend or a family member or even multiple family members during this reign of terror. And it really is unique in world history for a lot of reasons, but in one way because of how quickly it all happened. The Khmer Rouge ruled in Cambodia for a little bit under four years, from 1975 to 1979, which is just a small blip in the course of human history, but the scale of the tragedy of the Cambodian genocide and the Incredible stories of personal sadness and journeys of survival that ordinary Cambodians 
had to go through during this period is truly remarkable. And we will get into some of the long-term trends and causes of what happened here, but it's important to keep sight of the fact that for the people in this story, it must have felt like the world was turned upside down in a second. Yukimni Chan, after being expelled from Phnom Penh with his family as a child, watched as family members died all around him of starvation and malnourishment and violence. And he talks about the feeling of things being different in a single moment. With real courage, he describes the death of his little sister, saying, quote, One day, as we sat together in the hut, Sinowin put her head on my lap and said, Kimney, I don't know if I can live any longer. Can I have a spoon of rice? My heart was breaking. It was such a little thing, she asked. But we had no rice. I got up and brought her our last cup of water. Sister, I said, I have no rice to give you. Drink this water. She looked into my face for a moment, and then she sipped the water. She put her head down on my lap, and then she died. End quote. For Yukimni Chan and millions of other Cambodians during this time period with similar stories, history and life turned in a moment. Nothing would ever be the same and the experience of the Cambodian genocide would never be forgotten. With 1.5 to 2 million human beings dead in just four short years, The questions of who is to blame for this disaster, or what is to blame for this disaster, why did it happen, how did it happen, and how do we achieve justice for the victims, if that's even possible, all of those questions are central to our study of the Cambodian genocide and what we can learn from it going forward. What is ultimately to blame for this is something that historians have debated over the years. And we have to keep in mind, this is a relatively recent historical event, so there's still a long way to go as far as our study of the topic. Was it communism? Was it racism? Was it the thirst for power? Was it ideology, culture, imperialism? Were there other factors? Ultimately, is it some fusion of all of these different causes that are building towards this Cambodian disaster that we see unfold beginning in 1975? I think all of these questions are important to keep in mind as we go through some of the background and some of the buildup towards the Cambodian genocide. And the question of where to start the story is always going to be a tough one. Historian Ben Kiernan starts with a geographical lay of the land. Cambodia, of course, located in what we would call Southeast Asia, bordered by Thailand in the north, Laos in the northeast, Vietnam to the east, and the Gulf of Thailand and the South China Sea to the south. Ben Kiernan says, quote, 5,000 years ago, the land of Cambodia did not exist. It lay submerged beneath the South China Sea, between two peninsulas. At its mouth, the Mekong River poured silt into the ocean near what is now Cambodia's northern border. That silt gradually filled up the bay, and Cambodia emerged, a country so flat that what had once been islands still stand out prominently as hillocks in a vast alluvial sea. Owing to the large volume of silt and the great speed of the Mekong when the vast flow from Tibet's melted snows is supplemented by the heavy tropical rainfall in mainland Southeast Asia, 
the bay fills up relatively quickly. End quote. This created what is known as the Tonle Sap, a huge inland lake in the center of Cambodia that sort of fills up and depletes itself as the flow of the Mekong River alters yearly. Cambodia, located in that Southeast Asia tropical zone, deals with wet and dry seasons, the monsoon, heavy rainfall during the wet period, and then a more dry period where there's much less rainfall. Historian Ben Kiernan quotes a Chinese visitor in the 13th century talking about his experience in Cambodia, saying, quote, In no other part of the world have I ever had the sensation of being surrounded by fish in whatever direction I turn. End quote. So you're getting this sense of Cambodia as this vast wetland, more or less tropical climate, wet and dry seasons. And during that wet season, rice fields are abundant. And this agricultural flavoring with farming and rice fields and fishing drove the Cambodian economy for a long time, especially in the 20th century. And that's more or less where historian Ben Kiernan starts his analysis of what happened in Cambodia under Pol Pot. He says that Cambodia was, quote, mummified by 90 years of French colonial protectorate, end quote. What he means there is that in the late 19th and early 20th century, there was a expansive round of European imperialism in Asia and particularly Southeast Asia. So in the case of Cambodia, it was ruled as a protectorate by the French. So there is a French ruling class, but according to Ben Kiernan, that French colonial protectorate is preserving and enhancing the traditional elite, and a traditional social structure. This means that most people in Cambodia during this period, before Cambodia got its independence, were peasant farmers. Probably about 80% of Cambodians were rural farmers, subsistence farmers, living in the countryside with mostly just their nuclear family, And these people, often living very deep in the countryside, away from cities, away from international connections, were contrasted with the 20% of people who were more of the upper class of Cambodia. This could be international farmers, urban elites living in cities and towns. And you get this sense that there was little social cohesion between these two groups. There was not necessarily any network to a broader society that connected these two worlds of Cambodia, for lack of a better term. Ben Kiernan says, quote, Cambodia nearly comprised two separate societies, with little exchange between them, one rural, producing for subsistence, the other largely urban, producing a few goods for the world market and consuming mostly international commodities. Rice growers provided food for the city dwellers, but the cities offered little for rural consumption. End quote. We're beginning to see this divide between urban and rural, between peasant and really most of the other classes in Cambodia that Pol Pot and the Communist Party of Cambodia would exploit and find rifts in order to make those cracks wider. I think economically, those cracks are most obvious, but socially as well. Most of Cambodia was Buddhist, and about 80% of Cambodia was ethnically Khmer. But over time, minority populations of different ethnic groups began to develop mainly in the cities, 
So this could be Vietnamese, Chinese, Lao, Thais, a Islamic community known as the Cham. And Pol Pot and his Communist Party would take advantage of the way that there seemed to be two different societies operating in Cambodia. The rural ethnic Khmer people were the ones producing the food for the people in the cities. They were doing the hard work, and they were the ones who were really contributing to the survival of Cambodia, while the people in the cities, these minority groups and these urban elites, so to speak, were taking advantage of all of that hard work and eating the food, but they weren't contributing anything back to that rural community. They were consuming international goods and trading internationally, and according to Pol Pot and his communist rhetoric at least, this urban group was taking advantage of the peasant community of Cambodia. All that being said, while this two societies thing is going on in the background in Cambodia, there's also some pretty huge political changes that are happening in the mid-20th century. After World War II, European imperialism is more or less falling apart. Nationalist movements are popping up all around the globe, and Southeast Asia is no exception. And in 1954, in large part due to this nationalist pressure, the French leave Indochina, another word for Southeast Asia. And in the power vacuum that is left behind with the French leaving, you're left with a lot of different groups vying for control. Whether it was United States or Soviet or Chinese imperialism as the Cold War was beginning to heat up, or whether it was these nationalist movements inside of these areas in Southeast Asia, or whether it was the individual communist parties or political parties inside of these new countries, as we know, things did not transition smoothly in Southeast Asia. As the Vietnam War is raging in Vietnam, just east of Cambodia, Cambodia is also seeing the rise of its own Communist Party. By 1963, the mysterious Pol Pot is in charge of the Communist Party of Cambodia, and they are more or less in open rebellion against the Cambodian government, which is led by a man named Prince Sihanouk. Sihanouk is perceived as being unable to deal with the threat of Pol Pot and the civil war that's raging in his country. There's a military coup backed by the United States, which puts a man named Lon Nol in charge in 1970. And I realize I'm going through this kind of fast here, but I think the basic idea, according to historian Ben Kiernan, is that while the traditional Cambodian government, whether it's Prince Sihanouk or Lan Nol, is bumbling and fumbling their way through this post-imperialist Cambodian society, the Communist Party under Pol Pot is gaining strength during the 1960s and early 1970s. In large measure, this gaining of strength is due to nationalism. Sihanouk and Lan Nol are seen as being associated with the United States, and as they're cracking down on communists and perceived leftists, they end up driving a lot of nationalists right into the Communist Party. It's important to note that the Communist Party of Cambodia and a lot of these communist parties in Southeast Asia and other places during this post imperial period are born out of nationalism. That desire to throw off the yoke of the imperial oppressors as they perceive it was strong and it was a driving force of the Communist Party and a driving force for Pol Pot. And when you look at the facts of what was happening 
in Cambodia, it's hard not to see their perspective. As we know, by 1966, U.S. intervention in the Vietnam War is escalating to unprecedented levels. Now, this is a whole separate story, and it's one I'd like to do one day, but the idea is that as troop numbers are escalating, both on the U.S. side and the North Vietnamese side and the South Vietnamese side, these troops have to be fed in Vietnam, which of course neighbors Cambodia. And a lot of that food that these soldiers end up eating is coming from Cambodia. According to Ben Kiernan, in 1966 alone, 130,000 tons of rice were exported to Cambodia in 1966, and this is only the smuggled rice that's going over the border. As we know, that's not taxable, which is hurting the economy, it's hurting the government legitimacy and their ability to plug holes as holes are popping up on this sinking ship in Cambodia. Vietnamese communists are increasingly, as a result of this escalation of the war, now using the Cambodian border for sanctuary. So the United States military is responding by reconnaissance and mine-laying missions into Cambodia. This later escalated into full-on bombing missions. Historian Ben Kiernan says, quote, About 161,000 tons of bombs were dropped. The civilian toll is unknown. The U.S. aim was to destroy Vietnamese communist forces in Cambodia or drive them back into Vietnam. End quote. These bombing campaigns are creating all sorts of domino effects that quite simply are not good. First of all, the government of Cambodia doesn't think that these bombing raids are actually decreasing the numbers of Vietnamese communist forces hiding in these sanctuaries. Secondly, it's killing untold civilians. It's creating unforeseen consequences and refugees that are now streaming across the Cambodian border. And the U.S. military apparently doesn't think the campaigns are working, but they respond by escalating further hoping that more force can solve the problem. In 1970, Richard Nixon, President of the United States, launches pretty much an invasion of Cambodia. And it's really not a good look for the United States. And as a domino peripheral effect, it's going to drive a lot of Cambodians right into the hands of Pol Pot and the Communist Party. Historian Ben Kiernan says, quote, By 1970, Cambodia's frontier with Vietnam was breaking down. It was unable to withstand the pressure exerted by the two mighty contending forces that had been expanding and straining against one another in the limited space of southern Vietnam since the escalation of 1965. The pressure was economic, demographic, political, and military. Cambodia's rice crop drained into devastated Vietnam, while both Khmers and Vietnamese fled into Cambodia, with the U.S. military and Air Force in pursuit. Richard Nixon's May 1970 invasion of Cambodia, undertaken without informing Lon Nol's new government, followed simultaneous invasions by Saigon and Vietnamese communist forces. It created 130,000 new Khmer refugees, according to the Pentagon. By 1971, 60% of refugees surveyed in Cambodia's towns gave U.S. bombing as the main cause of their displacement. The U.S. bombardment of the Cambodian countryside continued until August 15, 1973, when Congress imposed a halt. Nearly half of the 2.7 million tons of bombs dropped on Cambodia, fell in the last six months. From the ashes of rural Cambodia arose Pol Pot's Communist Party of Kampuchea. 
It used the bombing's devastation and massacre of civilians as recruitment propaganda and as an excuse for its brutal, radical policies and its purge of moderate communists and Sihanoukists. This is clear from contemporary U.S. government documents and from interviews in Cambodia with peasant survivors of the bombing. End quote. One Cambodian said that, quote, the bombers may kill some communists, but they kill everyone else too, end quote. Another survivor was asked if the Khmer Rouge, the communist party in Pol Pot, used the U.S. bombing of Cambodia as a way to recruit more people into the communist party. He says, quote, oh yes, they did. Every time after there had been a bombing, they would take people to see the craters, to show how big and deep the craters were, to see how the earth had been gouged out and scorched. The ordinary people sometimes literally shit in their pants when the big bombs and shells came. Their minds just froze up, and they would wander around mute for three or four days. Terrified and half crazy, the people were ready to believe what they were told. That was what made it easy for the Khmer Rouge to win the people over. It was because of their dissatisfaction with the bombing that they kept on cooperating with the Khmer Rouge, joining up with the Khmer Rouge, sending their children to go off with them. Sometimes the bombs fell and hit little children, and their fathers would be all for the Khmer Rouge. End quote. It's estimated that this U.S. invasion of Cambodia and this U.S. bombing campaign in Cambodia, which had the intention of helping to win the Vietnam War and killing Vietnamese communists, ended up killing about 150,000 Cambodian civilians. And this is in just four short years, from 1969 to 1973. And take away whatever you think about the Vietnam War and whether or not this campaign was effective in winning the Vietnam War doesn't seem like it was very effective based on the evidence, but take that aside for a second and look at the impact of this bombing campaign on Cambodia. Aside from the tragedy of 150,000 dead civilians, it's having huge political ramifications connection to these United States military raids is hurting the legitimacy of the Lan Nol government, and it hurt the legitimacy of the Sihanouk government before that. And it seems like anyone with these nationalist sentiments, which are so high during this time period throughout Southeast Asia, is now being absorbed into the Communist Party. Pol Pot is in perfect position to take the people upset by these bombing campaigns who've lost family members and friends and say, hey, the current government is friends with those guys who are killing you. I'm the one who can help you, protect you, and throw off that imperial yoke. So you have this interesting connection between nationalism and communism working together. A lot of people dispute that number, 150,000 deaths, civilian-wise, from these U.S. bombing campaigns. But to me, once numbers get high enough, the exact number becomes less and less relevant. Take half of 150,000, and that's still 75,000 people who have family members and friends and who are going to be affected by this. That's a huge number of people that are being pushed basically into the Communist Party, right into Pol Pot's hands. And you can read story after story, account after account of ordinary Cambodian people who are very upset by this bombing campaign, and you can very easily connect the dots between the behavior of the U.S. military and the rise of Pol Pot in Cambodia. Ben Kiernan attempts to describe the anger that many people felt in regards to the Lan Nol government, who was seemingly in cahoots with the United States and, of course, the United States military. He describes what happened when communist troops, known as CPK troops, took over a military establishment. He says, quote, 
In April 1975, when CPK troops took the country's second largest city, Badenbong, they headed straight for the airport. Finding two T-28s, they tore the planes apart with their bare hands, according to a witness. They would have eaten them if they could, he added. End quote. So you have this visceral anger by the part of many Cambodian citizens. You have that two societies dynamic that we talked about earlier between urban and rural. You have an economy that's in the tank, largely due to the way this rice is being exported to feed the combatants of the Vietnam War. You have political chaos and upheaval. You have a civil war that's being raged between the Communist Party led by Pol Pot and the traditional government now led by Lan Nol and the Cambodian military. You now have United States planes dropping bombs and killing civilians in Cambodia and thousands, tens of thousands of people being killed. And the stress from all of these different factors is fueling the fire of Pol Pot and the Communist Party. By April 17th of 1975, the Communist Party led by Pol Pot had gained enough steam and won enough military victories to surround the capital city of Phnom Penh and finally put an end to the Cambodian Civil War. The reign of the Khmer Rouge had begun. I think before we get into what happened in Phnom Penh with the forced migration of people out of the city, it's worth digging into Pol Pot a little bit and his Communist Party to unpack what they really believed. First of all, you're going to see a lot of different terms used to describe roughly the same thing, the government in charge of Cambodia led by Pol Pot and the Communist Party. So you might see Angkor, you might see the organization, Khmer Rouge, Democratic Kampuchea. The CPK is a shorthand term that's used. I'll probably stick to Khmer Rouge when describing them for the most part. And each of these terms has slightly different meanings and connotations and uses in appropriate places. but. More or less, it's the idea of this Communist Party of Cambodia. And in many ways, certainly by the end of this thing in 1979, this was the party of Pol Pot. So uncovering the way he thought about the world and his ideology is going to be important to this story. He was born by the name Salath Sar. He was born to a pretty wealthy family who had palace connections. His siblings worked in the palace, and he became accustomed to a palace lifestyle. As a member of the urban elite, so to speak, he was able to get education abroad in France. There really was no robust system of public education in Cambodia during those post-colonial times, and Pol Pot would eventually use this to his advantage, but anyway, he's being educated overseas. He joins the French Communist Party for Cambodia, and over time, he uses his palace connections and his skillful organizational skills to take control of the Communist Party in Cambodia. By 1963, he controls it. And by 1975, with the fall of Phnom Penh, he is in charge of Cambodia under the codename Pol Pot. You might also see Brother Number One. From a ideological perspective, the first thing to understand is that Pol Pot was highly nationalist. As we've said, this was not uncommon at all for political parties in this region of the world, considering the colonial and imperial incursions that have been going on there for centuries. And then, of course, this flares up with the Vietnam War and the escalation of that that we talked about. So Pol Pot is nationalist, and this also means that he's pro-Khmer. So we said the ethnic makeup of Cambodia, 
about 80% Khmer, and these people are mostly in the countryside, and that's contrasted with the diverse urban populations who Pol Pot does not necessarily support. It's also worth noting that there's a huge population of Khmer people inside of Vietnam as a result of the borders that were drawn up in the colonial period, very similar to something like World War I, after World War I, where the great powers are dividing up the Middle East and different ethnic groups are left on different sides of the borders and the whole thing is a mess, and so on and so forth. Similar situation here. This fact of demographics, as well as the nationalist and pro-Khmer ideology that Pol Pot believed in is important for the second part of Pol Pot's ideology, which is anti-Vietnamese. So the first thing is nationalist, the second thing is anti-Vietnamese. There is absolutely a racial element that we're going to get into that factors into what happened in Cambodia. Pol Pot wanted to expel Vietnamese people, he wanted to expel Chinese people to a lesser extent, and other ethnic groups from Cambodia in order to purify it. And being the nationalist that he was, he also wanted to bring those Khmer people who lived in Vietnam into his empire, into his country, and in the long term, that was going to mean war with Vietnam. Now, the next part of Pol Pot's ideology is probably the obvious one, which is communism. And he wanted to bring Cambodia into a truly communist system based on agriculture and rural communes that really no one else had seen before. Of course, the Chinese had the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, but Pol Pot really wanted to take that to the next level. So he tried to implement Many of the standard tenets of communism, most people would say, he wanted to evacuate the towns and the cities, send people into the countryside to work. He wanted to abolish markets and money. He abolished property, closed schools and hospitals, abolished religion quote-unquote, modernize the agricultural and industrial system of Cambodia with forced quotas and targets and dates, similar to something like the Great Leap Forward in China. All of this is pretty standard fare for communist ideology. The idea is to equalize the playing field by abolishing property and markets and money, send people into the countryside to work in the fields or in factories producing the materials that everyone in the country as a whole can use and share in together based on the quotas set by the Communist Party. Thus far, we have nationalism, anti-Vietnamese, communism, as three of the pillars of Pol Pot's ideology. And the last pillar, in my opinion, is this idea of what was known as, quote, internal screening. Basically, this meant that any opposition to the Communist Party or to Pol Pot was going to be crushed. Enemies and spies and potential enemies were seen at every corner and behind every door for the cadres and the upper leaders of Pol Pot's Communist Party. And they had a very ends-justify-the-means mentality to this. Violence and killings and executions were not seen as a bug, they were seen as a feature. Opposition to the party was systematically crushed over the time that the Khmer Rouge ruled, which we will see. Lesser ethnic groups and lesser classes were removed, dispersed, and scattered. Family members and friends of people who were purged ended up being purged themselves in order to protect the party and safeguard them from vengeance. 
So I think it's safe to say that violence was a pillar of the Khmer Rouge regime, in addition to communism, nationalism, and anti-Vietnamese sentiment. It is worth noting that there was opposition to Pol Pot and his internal inner circle. This opposition came from inside the party and from outside the party in the form of rebellions and resistance and different zones of Cambodia doing things different ways, even though they were all paying tribute to Pol Pot in one way or another. But the central ideology of Pol Pot and the pillars on which it stands are going to be important for understanding the totality of this story because ultimately his vision is what's going to be implemented in Cambodia. And that brings us to April 17th of 1975 with the evacuation of Phnom Penh. As the Khmer Rouge streamed into the city, many people cheered their arrival, some perhaps in fear, some perhaps doing it in confusion, and some maybe just happy that the civil war in Cambodia was over. But within hours, very few people would be cheering. The Khmer Rouge put out orders to evacuate the city immediately, sometimes giving people as little as 10 minutes to collect their belongings and get on the road. Orders from soldiers were delivered on loudspeakers and bullhorns declaring, quote, the inhabitants who put up resistance or refuse to take to the road will be liquidated as enemies of the people, end quote. There we see the use of enemies of the people, a term often used to bully and intimidate throughout history, a precursor to violence and totalitarianism. And that's exactly what happened during the evacuation of Phnom Penh. Ministers, military people, officials from the previous government were rounded up and executed. There were book burnings, property and materials thrown into the Mekong River. Hospitals were evacuated, sick patients told to get on the road. Basically, an entire city forced to leave most with no clear destination. Many were told that they would be able to return in three days, and the Khmer Rouge announced that the Americans were going to bomb the city, and that's why they had to evacuate. A lot of Cambodians believed this because, of course, the Americans had been bombing areas in Cambodia for a number of years, so it definitely was plausible that American bombs could be dropping in Cambodia, and it's another example of how the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot were able to use anti-imperialism and sort of the actions of the U.S. military in Vietnam and in Cambodia as a way to motivate people to do what they wanted to do. Many people knew this threat of American bombing was phony, but Often they had no choice. It was either leave and join the streams of people getting on the streets and heading towards the countryside, or die. A soldier by the name of Chin Fuen says that, quote, We went to Phnom Penh to search for enemies hidden there and drive the people out. We were told to tell people to leave for three days and that then they could return. We were told to shoot people who refused. Our group shot two or three families north of the market. End quote. Ben Kiernan quotes a civilian describing what he saw on the road. Quote, two piles of bodies in civilian clothes, as if two whole families had been killed, babies and all. Two pieces of hardboard stuck out of the pile, and someone had scrawled in charcoal for refusing to leave as they were told. End quote. You have to imagine just the chaotic scene that was unfolding. People and families basically being tossed out of their home, having to choose which items to pack, which items to leave behind, 
families just trying to locate each other to be together as they took off on foot, many with no food or limited supplies, and thousands and thousands of people streaming onto roads and walking, many with no clear destination. Historian Ben Kiernan quotes some witnesses and participants in this scene, saying, quote, Smith May describes the scene, quote, We moved very slowly in the heat of the day. Some people were carrying their possessions on their back or on bicycles. Others had hand carts, which they pushed and pulled. They were overloaded with families balancing on them and parents pushing. Those of us with cars were the lucky one. Children cried out that they were being squashed in the crowd. Everywhere people were losing their relatives. Patients driven out of the hospitals were pushed in their hospital beds by relatives who struggled with the beds like ants with a beetle, some with their plasma and drip bumping alongside. End quote. Back to Ben Kiernan again. Limbless, Lon Knoll soldiers hobbled and crawled with the crowd. Quote, I shall never forget one cripple who had neither hands nor feet, writhing along the ground like a severed worm, or a weeping father, carrying his ten-year-old daughter wrapped in a sheet tied round his neck like a sling, or the man with his foot dangling at the end of a leg to which it was attached by nothing but skin. End quote. There is a lot of accounts of what happened in this evacuation of Phnom Penh, and they all tell a very similar story. Violence and chaos and death. Thousands were killed, families were separated, and in a city of about two million, you have to remember that the logistics of a day or week-long journey on foot is going to be sloppy, particularly when for many of these people there was no clear destination, the instructions were not clear, this was coming as a total shock and a total change in the way they were living their life. Violence and executions of disobedient citizens are happening, and all told, just in this initial evacuation period, 20,000 people wind up dead whether that's sick people in hospitals perishing on the side of the road, citizens being executed by the Khmer Rouge, starvation, fatigue, 20,000 people dead, and the reign of darkness perpetrated by the Khmer Rouge was underway. You might be wondering why it was necessary to evacuate the cities in this manner, and... The answer to that question is that it follows from the logic of Pol Pot and the Communist Party's ideology, which we discussed earlier, those four pillars of nationalism, anti-Vietnamese sentiment, communism, and violence. Uchban Chun, who was a deputy secretary in one of the zones of the Communist Party, talks about the propaganda that was used to justify this evacuation of Phnom Penh, saying, quote, One, the city people have had an easy life, whereas the rural people have had a very hard time. Two, the city people were exploiters. Three, the morality of the cities under La Nol was not pure and clean like in the liberated area. Four, the city people shirked productive work. End quote. This is standard Khmer Rouge propaganda, and it fits in nicely with that two worlds thesis that Ben Kiernan put forward earlier, where you have the rural population that is mostly where the Khmer Rouge's base is, and you have the city people who they don't like because they view them as exploiters. Now, another reason they had to evacuate the cities is because Cities are a problem for people who have racial superiority politics. And the reason for this is that Cambodia and most cities in the world are diverse, and they're filled with minorities and people from different countries and a variety of different perspectives, and usually this leads to art and culture and 
a mixing of different ideas that people who believe in racial superiority don't like. That same communist official would go on to say, quote, The main thing was that we could not be assured who the people in Phnom Penh were. End quote. A third reason the Khmer Rouge evacuated the cities was there was a very real worry that the country would starve if there wasn't enough people to work and produce more rice. If you remember, the economy was tanking and there was a very real concern that the country would starve. Ben Kiernan also thinks that the evacuation of the cities of Cambodia was a long term plan in a military sense. If these big, easy targets were not filled with people, then it would be more difficult for a potential Vietnamese invasion to deal with. Ben Kiernan says, quote, The emptying of the cities was part of a strategy of continuing warfare to reunify the country's ancient territories on the basis of racial homogeneity. For this campaign, Cambodia would be in better fighting shape without vulnerable population centers, end quote. Ben Kiernan also thinks it's simply easier to control people as a totalitarian regime if they're in the countryside as opposed to the cities. He says, quote, From now on, there would be no assembling constituency to whom dissident or underground political activists could appeal or among whom they could quietly work. No human agglomeration facilitating private communication between individuals. Nowhere that the exchange of news and ideas could escape tight monitoring that reduced it to a minimum. No venue for a large crowd to assemble, except on CPK initiative. No audience for anyone to address, no possibility of pressuring the nerve center of the regime by means of popular demonstrations in the capital. End quote. So the idea is that if people are spread out and they don't know where they are and they're separated from their families and friends, it's going to be a lot difficult for them to organize rebellion and resistance. And of course, finally, the evacuation of the cities fits in nicely with the communist ideology and the agricultural communal lifestyle that Pol Pot was trying to implement in his country from an ideological perspective. With the evacuation of the capital city of Phnom Penh and other cities like it, the first stage of the Cambodian tragedy was finished and the people of Cambodia were now in place for the Khmer Rouge to further implement violent and deadly agenda. Tragically, for the people of Cambodia living through this, there is still a long way to go. They would soon have to endure more chaos, violence, starvation, war, and genocide.